Good morning, Covenant Church. How are you? Good? What a dreary day to get out of bed and to come to the house of the Lord, but you did it. You made it. You did it. You did it. Yay. Come on, Dora, the Explorer fans. Good to see you this morning. I know uh, God is happy that we are here because he's here whether we are here or not. And it's nice that uh, we're here too. So we are going to continue the series this morning at face value. And this is the four features that further your faith. Try to say that quickly. Four features that further your faith. These features are the likeness of Jesus in the earth. When he was on the planet, he showed us through the gospels different sides of himself. So the four first gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're covering in this series. John was last week. That was the face of the lion, that Jesus gives us this fierce, determined, passionate picture of his love for God. Do anything to please his Father. And that is what we should look like. I don't mind looking like a lion or even like a man or an eagle, but the ox, I'm not so sure about that. When we get to that one, we'll talk about that. Um, not many people want to look like an ox. Or last week, they, they mistakenly had a water buffalo up there. Uh, none of us want to look like that either, but, but we are supposed to. And those four features really give us a four-dimensional image of the likeness of Christ. He was all man, all God. And the book of Luke that we are diving into today, how many of you were able to read the book of John this last week? Good. You can still read it. You don't get an F today. You're here. You get an A+. Plus. But I encourage you to read it. Luke is a little bit longer. Uh, these are the pages between my paperclip here. But the book of Luke gives us a very different picture of Jesus, even though there's many of the same stories. Luke was actually a physician, and many believe he was Greek. He was definitely a Gentile. He was not a Jew. So his perspective was very different and, and really covered a lot of the psychological and relational aspects of the different people groups Jesus ministered to. But let's look at, like we did last week, let's look at the specifics of Luke that make this book a little different than the other synoptic gospels. Jesus, the son of man, is the picture we get from the book of Luke. And when we begin with the book of Luke, we go through the the, the birthright of Jesus, which was his genealogy. Last week in the book of John, I told you he didn't start with genealogy. He started with in the beginning was the word because John was establishing that, that Jesus was at the beginning. There was no genealogy. But in this genealogy, Luke actually follows the bloodline of Christ, but he doesn't go through his father, Joseph, he actually follows the birth line and the bloodline through Mary. Now, this is significant because it was very different. This wasn't done in that day. He probably sat and interviewed her. I love the book of Luke because it includes a lot more of the interaction Jesus had with females, how he felt about women. How many of y'all know Jesus loved women? Yes. Jesus loves women. Yes. I think we need a flourish t-shirt that says Jesus was a feminist. I know that that's a buzzword, don't take it wrong. What I'm saying about that though is he empowered women. He made sure they were included in the work of scripture. If it weren't for him, they would have been edited out because in, in their day, it, it was not something to uh, brag about a conversation with a woman, especially uh, a woman that was not a Jew. But there were many interactions that Jesus had. And so to follow his bloodline through Mary was significant. But it also establishes, because he got his DNA, his physical flesh DNA did not come from Joseph. It came from Mary. So that's another significance of him showing us Jesus as the son of man, his, his flesh, the side of him that was acquainted with everything we go through, came through the bloodline of Mary. So his genealogy is established that way in the book of Luke and only in the book of Luke. Luke was a medical doctor, as I said, and his gospel contains precise medical terminology. Luke gives the most examples of Jesus healing the sick. How ironic, right? 
He describes the physical conditions healed by Jesus, and it was written, this book, primarily to Greeks, the cultured and the learned. It's a most complete, orderly, and classical description of Christ. The book of Luke also has the best description of the birth of Jesus and of his childhood, his early years, which we don't know a lot about from the other Gospels. It also gives us unique stories and parables, such as the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, that parable really covered a lot of the healing process. Uh, and you see why that mattered to a man like Luke. Because as a doctor, he knew that all miracles were not instantaneous. He was witnessing Jesus heal. And, and it, was a mo- it was a momentary, just a blink, and people would be healed. But he also knew, because of the story of the Good Samaritan, that there are emotional scars. There is a soul healing that takes time. Our wounds must be bound. We must be ministered to, right, over a period of time to get healing. The book of Luke establishes firmly that ministry is all about people. There's no ministry. There's no potential. There's no purpose outside of that framework. The book of Luke Luke gives us this. And last week, I, I really covered how we show God that we love him. And two of those things on that list uh, I want to mention today. One of them was to love people. Yeah, it's really similar. If you're a parent, you know what this feels like. You know, your kids tell you they love you, but they just sock their brother or sister in the face. You're like, <laughs> show me that you love me by loving your siblings. I've had conversations with my kids before, and they would go into, you know, just the irritation of, 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 of one of their siblings and give a lot of detail about that. And I would say, you know what? You're talking to somebody who loves them as much as I love you. So watch how you talk about them because they're my child. And I'm not going to let them talk about you the way you're talking about them. So I'm going to stop you right now. This is the way God says, you show me you love me. By loving one another. And you also show me that you love me by not loving the world. We covered that last week, but what that really means is it's not saying don't feed the poor, don't pray for the sick, uh, don't be benevolent outside the house, the, the, the walls of the church. That's not what he's saying by the world. He means don't conform to the image of the world. Don't fall in love with the system of the world and make that preeminent to please over pleasing me. You cannot love the world and love me. You cannot serve two masters. So you're going to have to step away from that affection you have for confirmation and move into transformation. So this is what Jesus calls us to in the book of Luke, to really love one another is principle. I've been really convicted as I read the book of Luke. I read it about three times this week. And each time I read it it's, it's, it's soaked in in a different way. But as I was following up on different questions I got about, about people wanting to follow, follow up on their calling and their anointing and find out what their giftings mean and what they were made for, that's our yearning. That's what we really want to know from God. That's why we're here this morning, to find the meaning in life. You know, and I never take for granted any time that I ever stand in front of an audience, I I see your villain. I know who your villain is. My job is to separate you from that enemy. Now, I'm not just talking about the devil. I'm talking about confusion, intimidation when it comes to understanding the word of God. That's your greatest enemy. The Bible is intimidating. But what I know is this, you were created to understand scripture. It is your fundamental language. It is written on your DNA. You were made to get this. You were made for it. So my job is to create as much space in the 20 minutes that I have on a Sunday or 30, I usually go over. a little maybe more than 30. Um, <laughs> Got to tell the truth up here. Shame the devil. But uh, my job is to drive a wedge between that voice of accusation and disqualification that you hear every day of the week saying the Bible is hard to understand. 
You're not going to get it. You have to have a degree to get it. You've got to have a pedigree. You've got you to have Bible class, Old Testament survey, and New Testament survey, and be able to draw timelines and have a chronological Bible. I'm telling you, you don't need any of that. It is written on your DNA because before, at the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word lives in you. Jesus is the Word. And when you receive him, you give him permission to work from the inside out. He's already working on the outside. So when we are saved, then we say, I'm all yours. There's no hidden places. You can have me. Do what you will with me. But the word then is planted in you. He's the word. And he helps you understand these things. And I love to always have this really deep, hidden, mysterious word on a Sunday morning that reveals, you know, the uttermost folds and parts of the Godhead. But the truth is, when you leave here, that will not change your life. What you need to hear on a Sunday morning is what you were created to do in the earth today. The word of God unlocks that for you. Yes, it was written thousands of years ago. It was made for you. It is a manual for understanding your potential. But at the, the ink it was written in was the blood of Christ. And that ink is all about loving one another. Therefore, any gift, any anointing, any potential you have is wrapped up first and foremost in the understanding that you are called to love. The Lord showed me this years ago, but I saw myself as God's gift to the world and my family and my friends. And I'm saying this, you know, with hubris, but what I mean by this is I was like, I am a truth teller. I am called to tell the truth. That is what I, 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 from my DNA, that's who I am. You can ask my Aunt Jenny. They used to keep me away from the first time guests because I would point out a mole on their face and ask them why it was there. And really weird, I'm, I was just one of those kids that would say the thing that nobody wanted anyone to say. And as I grew up, I recognized in relationships that I could look at someone and say, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to go. This is what you need to break up with. This is what you need to stop. And I recognized that I was taking the heaviness of my truth across a bridge that could not handle it. The bridge is relationship. And the bridge could handle 1,000 pounds, but my truth weighed 100,000 pounds. And what the Lord showed me is, Amy, there is no purpose for your gift. There's no purpose for your insight if you keep destroying the bridges of relationship. You fortify the relationship, build the bridge, spend all your time making sure it can handle and then carry the truth across. You and I, whatever we're called to do, it is not to be an island to ourselves. We cannot unlock the potential of what God has for us outside of the context of loving one another. Loving one another is what we're made for, amen? amen? So what does love look like? How do we love one another? When Jesus stepped into this earth and he, he looked at the way that we engaged and interacted with one another, he, he basically was saying, I see that you guys have a couple problems. First of all, everything you know about love Forget it. It's all wrong. Love is not a currency. Love is not an exchange. If love is to be real, it is sacrificial, but not reciprocal. Do not love and expect something in return. You can call it love, but it's not love. Real love says, I will give with no expectation. I keep no records of wrong. That is what real love looks like. So what I want to ask you to think about and just ruminate on as I move through this message is, if we're to look like Christ, then the origin of every prayer, passion, and purpose should be centered around people. So if that's true, how much of my prayer, my purpose, and my passion 
revolve around an answer for others? How much is focused on personal goals? Do my goals for 2019 look like God's goals for 2019? Or am I meeting the needs in my life by measuring myself against those goals? The journey of Jesus on earth was determined, not predetermined, by a let me get in and get out. Let me, get, let me be anonymous for all of my life. Nobody even know that I'm there. You know, I mean, he could say, this is already going to be painful. So God, can't I just be born, give my life, the redemption's done, the bridge is built, cosmos is, is, is healed between heaven and earth. Now they are free to come. But do I have to really have a relationship with them? Do, do I have to eat with them? Do I have to sleep under the stars with them? Do I have to travel with them? When, when you travel with somebody, you really know about their business. <laughs> do I have to be betrayed by them? Do I have to sit in a circle while they bicker about the fact that we don't have a hierarchical system? They want a pyramid of leadership in my squad, and I just want to circle. Do I have to have relationship with them? He could have been a God that said, just get me in and get me out. I'll die, I'll bleed, I'll do the minimum. But if he would have done that and he'd have been hanging on the cross and looked down and didn't recognize one face, one failure, one friend, he wouldn't have been as easily reminded of why. I had a friend, Hawaiian friend, who was an author. We were on a book tour in 2000 and he told me a story about Hawaii. He's lived there all of his life. And he said, you know, we, we get tsunamis. And this was before the really big one in Thailand that all of us later learned how devastating they could be. But in Hawaii, he said, you know, we've had a few. I've lived through a few. And he said, my brother-in-law actually um, believed he'd lost his whole family on the beach one day. Their house was very close to the ocean. And he'd been away. And the tsunami hit. They didn't have a warning. He had a brand new baby. And he searched the beach for hours until he pulled up one side of his house and uncovered his wife, found his infant in another part of the destroyed area of his garage. That, that would have been his garage. And, and he said he got them to the hospital. And later, when they were settled, one was on oxygen and they were being bandaged up. He said, we sat down and, and I looked down at his feet. And his feet, he had no shoes on, and his feet were covered in the deepest most grievous lacerations I'd ever seen. And he said, I, I knew that his wife and his daughter had some blunt force trauma and a few scratches, but he said, when I looked at his feet, I couldn't imagine that he hadn't even noticed, he hadn't even complained. And he said, I looked at him and said, we gotta see about your feet. How did you search? How did, how did you do this? How did you walk to town carrying your child? And how did you do this with feet that look like that? And he said, oh, that's simple. I just kept the why high. Jesus had the why high. And his relationship with the disciples revealed more to him about what we fight with, what we, what we deal with, what we struggle with when it comes to true love, to real love. And then he shows us how we got it wrong through his conversation in the book of Luke with the disciples, and I want to take you to those. First, I want to read Luke 6, 32, 33 says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. So Jesus was pointing out to them, you're looking at love as a point of leverage, I do something for you, you do something for me. You like me, I like you. And he's revealing to them, even the secular, the unbelievers do that. What makes this love different? If you know me and you love like me, then I'm telling you, we love those who hate us. We love those who beat us. We love those who betray us. Why? Because that's real love. Love is not reciprocal. It is sacrificial. He pointed out to them, you use love 
as leverage so that you can gain something. But if you wanna look like me, you're gonna have to look at love differently than the world. Love is not a currency to purchase position, loyalty, or favors. Love is not a ladder that you climb. In the book of Luke, we see that the disciples were endeavoring to use their love for Jesus and his love for them to build a hierarchy amongst themselves. Let's read about this in Luke 9:46. It says this. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, "Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great." Now, this is one of those stories where growing up in the church, hearing it over and over, I would just say, oh, it's some kind of riddle. I don't, I'm not sure how to interpret that, but I'm sure he meant something. Anybody ever read the Bible like that? And you're like, it's like the riddle of Samson. Uh, let me see how long I can ruminate on this and figure it out. Basically, what he was doing is taking a corporate ladder and saying, this is your goal, And he's putting a child at the top of it. And he's saying, this right here is what you should esteem to be and to serve. Why did he pick a child? Well, first of all, because, and anybody that works in the nursery knows this to be true. A child cannot write you a five-star review on Yelp. A child cannot write a resume for you to move on to your next step on the corporate ladder. When you serve a child, it is without any exchange of honor. Right? All the women and men that change diapers in the room say amen. Amen. A child cannot do anything for you to boost you up to a hierarchical place. And yet Jesus said, You want to be the greatest? This is what you need to be doing, babysitting. That kind of messes up the way that we work it out. Because even in the church world, we walk in and we immediately seek for what is the hierarchy here? Who are the honored? Where do they sit? And by the way, can I just say there are no no seats that do not belong to you in this auditorium. Please, someone, come sit on the front row. <laughs> All of the seats, when, when, we, when we first came, they were, they were, the ushers had been uh, told to cordon off the sections. And, and I said, can we just get rid of that? It's like we're steering people to, and it really doesn't matter because it won't be long until every single seat is full. It really doesn't matter where people sit. They need to sit where they're comfortable. But we seek for hierarchy. You know, I, I, I love this. It shocks me because a lot of people don't, haven't been able to serve up close uh, with our family. There are no people that serve harder or longer than the Hazes. I, I, I can tell you, my parents outwork all of us when it comes to serving. They cannot sit still. They do not sit still. Something needs to be done. They want to do it. And, and I'm their daughter, but I would be like, come on, can, at some point, can we all just have a vacation or get a break? They want to, but at the well, when we have this once a month, I always love for when women come and they don't see me a, little, a, a lot, and then they realize that I've been in the kitchen. I, I really would prefer to be in the kitchen than making potato salad, putting my foot in it. I'd rather be doing that. Now, you white folks in the room, please, I don't put my foot in it. Like, <laughs> literally. It's, it's a turn of phrase. I like to be cooking. I'd rather be cooking than to be teaching. But whatever God calls me to do, I want to do that. And it shakes people up, just like Jesus did in this. It shakes people up when... They go, wait a minute, why, why are you in the kitchen? Why are you doing that? Well, I'm like, because th- this, is, this is the greatest thing I can do is make you some slap your mama potato salad. <laughs> I'm going to feed you spiritually, but I'm just as happy 
doing this. Why? Because I've learned something about what real love looks like, what it feels like to really, the joy of serving, not the applause. I don't care about that. I can, I'd rather be serving you a meal. And God is saying, but I need you to give up what you'd rather do and do what I need you to do. How often, how hard is that for us? That's hard, that's not easy. But it shakes up our hierarchy and Jesus loves doing that. I'm gonna move my way through these notes pretty quick. What I loved about the first uh, part of this is that it says a dispute arose among them and then it said Jesus perceived the thought of their heart and figured out what it was about. How many times have you ever heard an argument or been in an argument and you know what you're fighting about is not what you're fighting about? That's what Jesus was addressing in this moment is going, I know what this is about. You all wanna know who's gonna be the vice president. And I'm not gonna answer that because the greatest among you is the one who babysits. 1 Corinthians 13, one through three says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. In that verse, he just gave us just about every mountain of influence in the body of Christ that any of us would attain to stand on. Yeah, you want to understand mysteries, you want to prophesy, you want to be known as the one who gives all the food away to the poor. Any of those things, they're going to all pass away. But love never fails. The relationship of love will last forever. So you and I, we're wasting our time on corporate ladders and collecting applause. If that's the way we think we're gonna find our purpose, we're wrong. And the reason for that is because if we want the well done, then we have to seek to be good and faithful, not to be great and famous. Completely contrary to what the world teaches us. The world teaches us how to love ourselves well, how to receive love. The whole focus of our culture is getting love. The focus of the kingdom culture is being love. What does that look like? Luke 9, 49 through 50. John answered and said, this is the John we read about last week, the lion-like John. He says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him for he who is not against us is on our side. This lion-like defensive posture, I'm gonna be fierce, thinks John, and I'm gonna work my way up the hierarchical proverbial ladder by showing him I'm his greatest defender. Hey, I'm your armor bearer, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, wow, my inner circle has really missed it. Even the beloved disciple has gotten it wrong. Why? Because we miss the point when we try to dictate and reject in the name of Jesus. Everything we know about love is wrong. The same argument comes up again in Luke 22 says, there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And Jesus wiped his forehead and said, oh, God, save me from these people. I'm glad you were listening. That's not what he said. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Depends on which system you're looking at. Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I'm among you as the one who serves. In a matter of words, he's saying, let my love be your example. Be a servant. The more you look like me, the more you serve mankind. So what do we learn from this? What is real love, loving one another, really look like? 
Jesus turned the table, he flipped the script, he said, it's not what you think. I'm gonna tell you what real love looks like. It means being a team player, John. It means not dictating how the rest of the body of Christ does what they're called to do. Bless them. If they're not against us, they're on our side. It means not putting your gift above serving the body of Christ. You know, I've gone through this in the past and, and I've seen it happen so much around me. And it looks like an evolution of maturity in your gift and anointing when you come to a realization that there's a certain atmosphere you need in order to access that anointing or you know, a certain time on the schedule. I, I got to a place where I was telling women's conferences, do not put me at 8.30 a.m. If I have a choice, please put me at, at night or in the afternoon, I'm better at that time. And the Lord came around and questioned me on that. And I'm like, well, you know, if they want the best out of me, you know, I, it's hard for me to even string a sentence together at 8.30 in the morning. And, and so if they want the best of me, this is, you know, this is how you made me. And I was making all these excuses. And the Lord said, but what about being instant in season and out of season? What about being all things to all people? Amy, if you look like me, make room for me. It's not just about your gift. Set yourself up not to be the winner. You know, and we can, we can evolve in our gift and anointing and learn a little bit about enough to be dangerous about our potential and our anointing that we begin to say, no, 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 I can't, I don't, I can't work in that schedule. That, that doesn't really set up my gift to, to win. And that's, if I finish the sentence for you, because if I finished it for me, that's what I would say. That doesn't really set my gift up to win. It didn't put me in the best light to do it that way. But God is saying, what about the fact that I have given you a gift to build the body of Christ, to support the body of Christ, not that the body of Christ is sent to support your gift. There's a difference. What comes foundational for you and now I look for opportunities to be a team player. I never played on a team. Well, actually I did, but I, I didn't do much playing. Uh, I was tall, so I could shoot a basketball, but that's pretty much all about basketball. I could do well. Um, I, I, I like sports where I know who's winning, and usually I'll, I'll give you the key to my to understanding me, honey, on this is I like boxing and UFC and the Olympics. And the reason I like those is really simple. I just know who's winning and who's losing. <laughs> when it's a single combat, it's pretty easy. Teams have always been hard for me. I was an only child for 10 years. I, would, I was used to just accommodating myself in my own space. But the Lord challenged me to become a part of a team. And I have to tell you without giving you a lot of details, uh, how much better my gift is for submitting it, even when it felt like it wasn't going to highlight my strengths. It's building the body of Christ in a way I could not do on my own. You and I are called to be team players and we're called to be real. Jesus said this, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for your friends. He's not asking us to die for him. He's just saying, can you put down your preferences when you're seeking me about your potential and about your purpose? Can you lay aside all of your preferences? Can you just follow the need? Can you be real? And what I mean by real is to be accessible, to be vulnerable, and to be practical. If Jesus was anything, he was practical. He, he didn't just say a prayer over people when they were hungry and pat down their feelings when they were sad. He fed them. He made sure they had a place to sleep. He took care of their physical needs. He healed them. He could have looked at them and said, you know what? In a couple years, I'm gonna die for your sins and you can spend eternity with me if you'd like. It doesn't really matter if you live in sickness. This life's gonna be over anyway. He didn't. He cared about what concerned them. He didn't predetermine his path. He allowed the people he met to determine what it was he did for them at that time. You and I need to follow the need. Real love can handle reality. When you sense someone is in need of Jesus with skin on, meet that need. 
The leadership on your life will be led by the needs that you meet. You'll find your place by meeting a need. Corporate America says it best. You wanna make a million dollars? You find a solution to a need people have. It's no different in the kingdom of God. You meet a need, it makes room for your gift. Why? Because your gift makes room for you. But if you're not willing to give it, if you're only willing to keep it and reserve it for special occasions and for special times when you'll get the attention, God is saying, wait, I thought it was a gift. I gave it to you. How about sharing it with some other people? Real love. These verses paint a picture of Jesus' message just about how we as humans use love as leverage to gain something in return. And he clearly outlines in all three occurrences that to love like God and to look like him, our love must be sacrificial, not reciprocal. I felt the Lord speak to me during worship to end this service in a particular manner right now is that you've been put in a situation, waiting for the situation to change so that it would miraculously reveal the integrity of who you are and what God's created you to be. So it would be seen. And you're waiting, like Pastor Bob said, for the circumstances to shift in order for that to shine. But you've come in alignment with the victim mentality. The victim mentality is connected and directly connected to perfect love. And I wanna point out why. Because the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. And when you are afraid of the storm in your life, when you're afraid of the situation, you've been buried by it and you come into agreement with, I'm a victim of this scenario. God's gonna have to break through. He's gonna have to set me free. He's gonna have to intervene. And God is saying, I put you in the middle of that situation for a reason. Hear me now. You telling God that you are a victim of your circumstance is like a diamond saying, I'm a victim of the heat. And a seed saying, I am a victim of the soil. God is saying the situation I put you in was exactly what you needed to bring about the thing that you are crying out to me for. The word is in you. You have everything you need right now. What you need to do is stand up in the middle of that situation, picture yourself on the boat. Say, I've got Jesus with me. I'm not in the middle of the storm by myself. I'm not a victim of this situation. He's given me the word. You know, sometimes I don't have the right words until I just stand up and say, hey, this isn't happening anymore. I am not a victim. And if God has surrounded me with this situation, then it's because he is calling out the greatness in my life. Stand up if you believe it. Right now. This is a tipping point. This is a tipping point. This is a tipping point. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We do everything in your name. The storm does not care about your opinion. Only cares about the word of Jesus. He's in the boat with you right now. He's planted himself in you. The heat is bringing out exactly the shine that he's called you to. The soil is pressing on you. You've been buried alive. And God is saying, I've surrounded you with exactly what it is you need. But what you have to do now is open your mouth. You need to intentionalize. All right, I'm the catalyst then. God put me in the middle of this place for a purpose. I remember at 11 o'clock at night, on August the 8th, I sat in a chemotherapy chair the $120,000 worth of drugs running into my body and praying that it would only go on assignment and kill the cells it was ordered to kill and nothing else. Prayed five hours. And I remember sitting there, I had balloons tied to my chair because my mother threw me a chemotherapy party. Who does that? (laughs) Victors, that's who does that. (laughs) 
And in that moment, I remember saying, God, all right, I'm here. The woman to my left was very ill. Oh, very, very ill. I don't even wanna describe what was going on with her. And we were, uh, we were all intensely looking and I was praying. And I said, God, if I'm gonna walk through the valley of the shadow of, the de of death, then I'm gonna turn the lights on while I'm here. So if you put me here, you put me here for a purpose. It's no different for you. I remember two months later, I had no hair and I was driving through Frisco and I started crying out to the Lord because of the deep well that had come forth in my, my heart and my mind. I knew I'd been changed and I said, in my car, I said, God, I feel like through this process, somebody died. I, I feel a resurrection. And he said, somebody did, Amy, you did. The old you. You know those balloons on your chair? That's your new birthday. You need to celebrate. Why? Because it was my moment to come out of my shell. It was my moment to say, I'm only on this planet for so many days, so many hours, so many minutes, and I'm not wasting one more of them. It is your moment. Whatever has buried you, whatever has tormented you, we break over you right now in the name of Jesus. Every demonic force that's been sent as assignment against your children right now, we break in the name of Jesus with power and authority. Father, we speak your name because the beautiful name of Jesus is the only thing that will break us through. But your word is in us because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made manifest and he planted himself in you. When you are in a situation, Jesus is in a situation with you. And resurrection power belongs to you. In Jesus' name, receive it, believe it. How beautiful. Death could not hold you. Come on. 